Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As I usually ask our esteemed audience outside of the temple, let's recite the mantra of the universe in its purity, Om Nam, seven times, if you could kindly join me with that. Om Nam. Om Nam. Om Nam. Thank you for coming back to this moment with the help of this mantra. And I can tell you, I got a lot of questions in advance from Don and maybe from some of you through Don. And uh, I'll be very happy to answer them. But please do not expect that you will hear what you want to hear. The first question was, how do we know whether we are awake or we are dreaming? So let's test our awareness. What color is the sky outside? Gray? You don't see the sky, you only see the clouds. So when you confuse the sky with the clouds, you are dreaming. The sky is always blue. The clouds can be gray, white, dark, even purple, sometimes red if the setting sun or the rising sun colors them. The sky is always blue. However, and that's the next step, who says that the sky is blue? The sky or us? We say the sky is blue. The sky does not do that. The sky does not know that it's the sky. Oxygen, which makes it blue, does not know that it's oxygen. We do. So if you look at this world, why do we have three dimensions in space and one dimension in time? Why do we feel captured in this body many times? We are born. The soul takes the body when we are born, like a chauffeur, a driver takes his or her car. And then we have our channels, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, the thinking mind, the feeling mind. And then these are our filters. Also, these are our tools. Without mind, you cannot think. Without heart, you cannot feel. Without eyes, you cannot see. And without ears, you cannot hear. Sometimes we feel that this is too little. Sometimes we feel this is too much. In Zen, we do not say whether being alive is good or bad. We would rather ask, what is your purpose in life? Why are you alive? So the origin of life or incarnation, as I was asked in another question, in Zen it's immaterial. In fact, Buddha Shakyamuni talks about it as the infinite cycles of life, from beginningless time until endless time into the future. Why is this unnecessary? Because everything you have done in the past resulted in this moment. Everything you are doing right now results in your future karma. So the past is gone, the future has not come. But there is this moment which we barely understand and barely attain and barely utilize. And being present in this moment is the key to actually live. We all have a body. We are all using this body. Our souls are interacting with each other and the world through this body. 
And if we truly attain that, then we know what life is. You wanted to have some other myth of origin? Well, open the Library of Congress. There are so many myths of origin. Which one of them is true? Which one of them is false? And when we are children, adolescents, and later on, more advanced students, we realize no matter what kind of myth we put behind our origin, it resulted with us being here with each other in this room tonight, on a Sunday night. So thank you for devoting your Sunday night for this. What you see, what you hear, what you taste, what you smell, what you touch goes through your filters. Your filters of dualistic thinking and feelings. What are these filters? These filters are centered around three very important groups. One is creation. What is it that helps me being creative, productive, reproductive, procreative? You know all these words. This is so important that anything that does not support that, we reject or try to defend ourselves from it. The second big group is possession. What we create, what we acquire, what we produce, we want to keep it. We want to live a good life, so we have possessions. The third one is recycling. It used to be called destruction, but it's not a good word. Recycling is a good word. Okay? That's impermanence, the third part. Certain things, certain people, certain karmas we want to wipe out from our consciousness. And for that we need impermanence. These three groups are so important that the Indians, they devoted three deities to them. Brahma is the creator, Vishnu is the maintainer, and Shiva is the destroyer or purifier. Think about it as that. When you do your dishes, or your own dishwasher does your dishes for you, you of course don't think about destruction. But hundreds of millions of bacteria are getting destroyed in a 45-minute cycle so that you would have clean dishes as a result. So Shiva is at work. Okay? These three instinct groups are primal to human existence. It would be foolish to deny them. And this establishes our threshold. What is it that we like? What is it that we dislike? What is it that threatens our lives? And what is it that supports our lives? It's decided by these three factors. In the Buddha's time, uh, life was pretty similar in its basics because we wanted to get happiness and we always wanted to avoid suffering. And Shakyamuni Buddha pointed out the Four Noble Truths which is the fact of suffering, the cause of suffering, the end of suffering, and the way to end suffering. You may ask, why did he not talk about just love and happiness and welfare? Because first we have to take away the hindrance. And if you take away suffering, then happiness appears naturally. In the Orient to the present day, they do not define happiness for you. You can do it by yourself, with your partner, with your family, with your peer group, with a larger group. So there was no preset definition of loving kindness and happiness, etc. Although in the West we really want positive concepts. We want to have it prescribed, defined, so that we could follow it, attain it. But the Orient went the other way and it said, if you take away the hindrance, you can go. I'm not telling you where to go. You can make your choice, but if you have a hindrance, I help you remove it. You have suffering, let's discover the cause. Let's see the end and let's walk the path together to end that suffering. And this is why most of these wonderful questions that I got about the origin of human life, about our destiny, whether we have a path or we have just some fate, they all come back to this moment, they all come back to your original mind, and it all comes back to this question, what are you doing right now? Are you paying attention? Are you awake? Are you alert? Do you see clearly? Do you hear clearly? Do you understand what I'm saying clearly? So the basic 
question is, what is this moment for you? What does this really mean to be present here and now? And Zen helps you do just that. What is interesting that in each and every religion there is a path of experience. Okay? In Christianity, mystical Christianity, really discarded words beyond a certain point. And if you read uh, Angelus Silesius or uh, Meister Eckhart, they really were different from usual priests. Or if you read the Desert Wisdom from the fathers who were in Anatolia between the 2nd and 4th century AD, they were practicing something really serious. They tried to attain God, not just talk about God or be clever about that. And the attainment was being in his presence. In fact, like closing up the gap between human and God. Later on, many of these notions became heretical and you could only believe, you could only cognize, you could only read about it, and you could only pray. How do you attain God instead of just maintaining this dualistic relationship that he or she, we don't know that for sure, is out there somewhere and you pray and you hope for a better life by prayer? How do you make one more step and really attain God or the mind that is God. In a Muslim faith, I'm pretty sure you heard about Sufism. And the Sufis, again, were not mainstream. In fact, they were persecuted from time to time because they were so radically different from mainstream Islam. They also have a patriarchal lineage. They also hand down a tradition where by either some special dance or some special practice, they try to attain Allah. They try to attain what that is, the divine mind, the divine consciousness. In Judaism, you have the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah is an amazing tradition which is very structural, very much different from the usual interpretation of the Torah and the Talmud. And it offers you insight into the existence of human being from the angle that no one has ever explored before. So these are the three monotheistic religions plus the path to attain something, go beyond concepts and have the divine experience as your own. It means a certain emancipation or empowerment that we all wish. In the Orient we call it enlightenment or awakening. When all dualities cease and when you are in the state of oneness, one with the world, one with God, one with this moment. And that's when we come back to Zen. The origin of Zen is jhana in Sanskrit. Literally, it meant absorption, dissolution, dissolution of your eye, becoming one, becoming clear, perceiving the true meaning of phenomena, all of that. As it went to China, it became channa. Then they chopped up the end of the word and it became chan. In Korean, it reads as son, and in Japanese, it's zen. Even in Buddha Shakyamuni's time, the jhana schools, the meditation schools, the experience-based schools, they were set apart from just repeating sutras or rituals. The Buddha himself said very clearly, if you just perform rituals, if you just are knowledgeable, it does not get you enlightenment. Enlightenment is one more step. Enlightenment is really going beyond any dualistic thinking or emotions, finally transcending the notion of I as a separate self from the universe. My late teacher, Zen Master Sung San, used to say, your thinking, and your mind, my mind are separate. If you cut off all thinking, your mind, my mind become one. Then you attain universal substance. Attainment is irreplaceable. You can see that for thousands of years we have been talking about this point, this point of oneness. We give it very gif different names, Buddha or Buddhas, God or Gods, sometimes even different names. But if we do not experience it, 
then these names are useless. Then we haven't done much. So the experience cannot be substituted with anything. Funnily enough, when we are thirsty, we understand that. Because I can call this H2O if I'm a chemist, water if I'm in an Anglo-Saxon territory, Wies for Hungarians, Mul for Koreans. But if I don't do this, I go thirsty and I can die. With water, with food, with love, we can understand that. And we can make a very clear difference between ideas and experience. However, when we come to anything transcendental that has no sensory perception in it, then it's very difficult. Because we believe that our ideas substitute the experience, and that is not true. That's what I talked about briefly in the case of the three largest monotheistic religions. Or when I mentioned Zen, you may know that a thousand years after Buddha Shakyamuni's time, they actually didn't write any more sutras. Commentaries, of course, they were abundant. But in China, there was a person called Bodhidharma. And Bodhidharma did something really, really significant. He really finalized what the form of Zen is, how we practice Zen. And I can demonstrate that for you by recalling his exchange with Emperor Wu. Emperor Wu was a wonderful Chinese monarch. And he was Buddhist. And he followed the Confucianist principles. And Deep in the background, they all had some Taoist education. So it's the best of all the three worlds that was supposedly guarding his mind and helping his path, both inside as a human being and outside as a ruler. So Bodhidharma, that's like 6th century AD, he arrives in China and then his reputation preceded him long before. And he's received by the emperor. And remember, when you do good things, it gets you merit. Good things, good results. Okay? So the emperor asked him an important question. I supported countless monks and nuns. I built numberless temples. How much merit did I get? Then Bodhidharma said, right into his eyes, no merit. That kind of shocked him. Next, he asked right away, then what is the meaning of the Holy Scriptures? Then Bodhidharma says, no holiness, only infinite space. The emperor was really startled, so he placed his last card. Then who is standing in front of me? And Bodhidharma said, don't know. Literally, it means no mind or wu shun, but it also means no thinking. Because mind for them is thinking. That's your small mind. It's your intellect. That's what makes your I, your notion of self. Okay? So, if Bodhidharma had a Zen stick, then even for the first question, he could have hit the emperor. And for the third question, he could have just hit his non-existent table because he didn't have one in front of himself. In fact, saying don't know is 50%. At that time, it totally blew the emperor's mind, though, and he said, I find nothing in common. You may leave. So Bodhidharma left, and he crossed the river Yangtze and went to the temple of Shaolin. And that's where he sat for nine years in a cave facing the wall. When uh, this exchange was over, the emperor asked his resident monk. All these emperors had advisors. And Master Chi was the name of this monk. And he said, Master Chi, who was this man? Master Chi, he had something. So he, had, he said, Your Majesty, he is the incarnation of Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, the Bodhisattva of compassion, carrying Shakyamuni Buddha's mind seal. Then the emperor was, oh, 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 so please bring him back, bring him back. Then Master Chi says, please don't bother your majesty. 
even if you sent the entire country after him, still he would not return. Okay? So this is a taste for you how Zen works. And Bodhidharma wasn't afraid of his imperial majesty. Also, he was not offensive. He didn't judge the emperor. That would be the end of him. But he was teaching the emperor Zen, not sutras, not Buddhism, not like a good monk, but he was the first to carry this kind of teaching from India to China. 28 generations after Buddha Shakyamuni, a thousand years pass, and this happens to seal Chinese spirituality or Chinese meditation practices and formulate it around the four principles of Zen, which go like this and partially answering other questions that I got in advance. First, do not depend on the scriptures. And I know in the West, since we want logos, we want logic, we want some kind of understanding and some kind of verifiable framework where we can go back to, refer to, find some truth in it, it's pretty hard to imagine that you can actually practice something meaningful, something transcendental, something worthy of human attention without depending on the scriptures. But it is possible. Remember when you bought your last appliance online or in a real store. You got that. You may have read the user's manual, but after that, you use the appliance without words and speech, knowing how it works. Human mind is the same. When we are born, we do not have user's manual. Many people with some level of erudition or attainment or clarity, they write us user's manuals. And some of them are appropriate, some of them are excellent, and some of them are really, really irrelevant. How do we know which one is correct? By trial and error. And this trial and error is that we try to find God, try to find enlightenment, try to walk on our path, and if we feel it's misleading us, then we stop and we try to search for something else, try to change our direction, change our practice. How is it possible that you do not depend on the scriptures, and yet you progress on the path? Well, if you look at the second principle, then you find some traction, some reference point, which says, directly pointing to human mind. So if you do not depend on anything external like a user's manual, you have to have the appliance right in your hand, the device that you need, the machine that you use, the vehicle that you take. So when you look at yourself and you ask, what am I? Or what is this? Saying my name, using my eyes, my ears, my tongue, what is it? that says, me, then you are dealing with the mind directly, without any intermediary layers, without any conceptual reference, without anything intellectual. We call that directly pointing to human mind. Now, when you meditate and you do this, then you can see your karma unmitigated, without any self-defense built in, without any symbolic layers interpreting or reinterpreting who you are. So this is direct perception. What's the result of this direct perception? It's awakening. So the third principle of Zen defines awakening as attaining your true nature. Just like we have many concepts of God in various belief systems in the West and in the Middle East, in the Orient, throughout the centuries, they developed many, many concepts of enlightenment depending on the tradition you looked at. And Zen set the matter very straight and says, attaining your true nature is awakening, is enlightenment. Everything else is karma. You walk on water, it's karma. You didn't walk on water a few years ago, you may not walk on water a few years later. So anything that comes and goes is just karma. Anything that appears and disappears is just karma. It's conditioned, it's interdependent, it's imperfect, so it's impermanent. And how can you transmit this once you attain it? 
And the fourth principle says, transmission from mind to mind. The practicing student wakes up to the same mind, to the same clarity as the teacher has. And this has a few serious implications. It's very rare that a student could go beyond his or her teacher. But in Zen, we encourage that, that the student should be like a young ego flying three times faster than the teacher can. It's number one important. That's what we call empowerment. That's what we call the correct transmission of the Buddha's teaching. So if you look at these four principles, wherever they are in operation, in whatever religion or culture, we can call that Zen or direct experience or awakening or the path to enlightenment. That's why it's not specific to any culture, any religion, human language, etc. And that's why it's wonderful and very exciting to speak about this here. I've read your homepage. You have some wonderful principles. How do you attain them? How do you truly experience them? How do you transcend them in a way that it's more than thought, more than just aspiration, something that truly resides in your heart and you can use it moment to moment to help all beings. That means saving all beings from suffering. I truly believe that if we practice our own spiritual path very sincerely, and we have a teacher, a correct teaching, and the students group where we fit in, then these three, they support us and we support them in turn. Then we can progress. How do you see your progress? You make less mistakes. You have more natural happiness. You are less of a nuisance to others. You can see that. Okay. So when you see that there's less suffering and more happiness, more harmony and less affliction, you know you are doing the right thing. But what you think about yourself is way, way less important than the way people actually perceive you. And I don't mean their opinion. Opinions are very personal. Direct experience is a lot more clear. And that direct experience, how people connect to you, experience you, perceive you, that's primary. What they say about you, not so important. <laughs> okay. So I think this is plenty for introductory. Like the whole enchilada of food for thought. And if you have any questions right now, I'll be more than happy to try and answer them. Who are you? <laughs> are you happy with this? I would say to this 50%. <laughs> Next is see clearly, hear clearly, connect clearly. So after this I say, Thank you very much for having me here and having this wonderful Dharma talk tonight. <laughs> Together, this is 100%. Okay, next. Uh, where am I going to go when I die? Where did you come from, from when you were born? <laughs> Elwood City, Pennsylvania. <laughs> no excuses policy here. When you were born, where did you come from? Try again. Oh, okay. Where did I come from? Now, oh, interesting question. Uh, from my mother and my father. That's just an intermediary state. That's where your body came from and joined your soul on that magical night when you were conceived. Mm. Where did you come from before that happened? The answer is, I don't know. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Zen means we turn the lack of information into clarity. Attain this don't know. Attain that, you'll get some good answer. So, when you die, where do you go? Same place. I don't know. It's not a place. If it's don't know, it's not a place. <laughs> Luckily, otherwise it would be rented out. <laughs> <laughs> Keep don't know, everything will be fine. Okay. Could you talk about jhanas or levels of attainment? Yeah. The four levels of jhanas are actually used in Theravada. The first is like the stream enterer, the Shrota Apana. And then there's the one street turner. 
the Shaki Dagamin, then the Nori Turner, Anagamin, and then the Arahan. These are the four levels. But over time, these were really, I should say, defined and redefined and commented all over the place. So the typical human mistake occurred. Young monks believe that if they just know this, that's enough. If they understand this, it's wonderful practice. Tang Dynasty China, soon after Bodhidharma, they developed what we call the Kongans. And the Kongans are not dependent on any level of jhana or any perceived grade of attainment. It depends on your intuition, whether you solve them or not. So we say, in the light of oneness, the four levels disappear. That's why we publish Kongans and we teach Kongans. It's not food for thought, it's fasting for the mind. It's called mind fasting. And that's how you go beyond all systems. When you have systems like, based on Indian philosophy, the four levels of jhanas are part of it, or Chinese philosophy, or anything religious, it's like a bridge. And you see that the other shore is better than this shore, and you step on the bridge, and you go pier by pier, and you go across the river of suffering, and uncertainty, and affliction, and traumas, and then you get to the other shore, if you do. Why? Many times we stop. Some people even jump from the bridge halfway through, or just one step before they get to the other shore. Some people even try to blow up the bridge because it's not theirs and they don't believe in it. But they were pushed, they were told, they were even coerced to go through. Zen is different. We have no bridge. We have a backpack. And the backpack is full of stones. Those stones are your karma. And when you make just one decision to practice and attain, then you throw one stone into the river and that becomes a stepping stone and you step on it. And as you practice more, you throw another stone and it becomes another stepping stone. And then as you go along, you can see the other shore, but you don't know when you get there. But funnily enough, when you throw the last stone from your backpack, the other shore is right there. That's how it works. And you would, of course, you can turn back. But it's your way. You have to pay for it with your beliefs, with your illusions, with your identification. And once you do that, you become spiritually adult. So that's the difference between just following some idea, following some framework, or actually working by your own motivation, by your own experience, by your own disillusionment. And that becomes realization practice. And that's why in Taoism they said, good teaching is bitter, correct path seems to lead backwards. You have, word, you, you have used the word soul a couple times. Yeah, I did. Uh, growing up in a Christian country, soul means you, you are, people would normally understand like you were born with a soul and when you die the soul goes to heaven or goes to hell. It's like this, this entity, this, which is not, a, not part of the body. Yeah. Now, when, when you say soul in, in your, your Korean Buddhist school, uh, or how, do, how do you relate that to the Buddhist anatta teaching, or no self? Very good. So, anatta means originally no soul. But as you gain some experience in the incarnation cycles, you inevitably identify with something. Identify with what you think, what you feel, what you taste, smell, touch, think, and that identification produces a chunk of karma. And it's hard to believe that but this chunk of karma as it gets bigger and bigger and more and more complex, that mental body is your soul. But it originally does not exist. That's why we can get liberation. That's why we can change anything within ourselves. If we had anything absolute within the soul, within the mind, then we couldn't change, because that would be immutable. Now, what you call the divine spark, or our transcendental core, we call that Buddha nature. That's the Vidya 
the seer or seeing itself because it has no person in it. And if I want to define that uh, per the Western mind, the body is the hardware, the soul is the software, and your true nature is the operator. So in Zen, we do not look for special hardware or special software, but we really want to find the operator. Because look at it, to the extent of your clarity, to the extent of your perception, you can see what goes on in the soul and in the body. And if we are ignorant, we just launch our karma to the world, and then we pretend to be victims of other people's karma. So the soul is your mental body. Your body is just a physical aggregate. There are many ways in the Orient uh, to interpret this, and one is in Korean Chinese, the O on the five skandhas. It's form, the body, feelings, perceptions, impulses, which is reaction, and consciousness. I find this like the building blocks of a house. So you have the basement, you have the walls, you have the doors and windows and floor, and then you have the ceiling and the roof. Okay? There's another way of classifying this or looking at this compound called sentient being. We have the five physical senses. Hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, and touching. Then we have conceptual thought as the sixth level. That's where the term Zen stick is attached to this. That's when the mind attributes the name to the form. Also characteristics that I feel this as medium soft. Okay? Medium length, not too short, not too long. That's what the sixth consciousness does. It puts name and form together, ideas and phenomena together. The seventh consciousness is the duality maker. It decides whether it's good or bad. It decides based on those three instinct groups which I mentioned in the introductory. It decides whether uh, it's me or not me. So the seventh consciousness is where we make the notion of self. Without that, we can't grow. We have to distinguish ourselves from the rest of the world. Human beings will always have the concept of I, but the big difference is do we have it clarified? Do we see it in its true function? Do we see it as it is, the notion of I? Or we are deluded, we are ignorant, we believe it's some absolute ego, whatever. So ever since we left the Garden of Eden, we've got that problem. But that problem is also our potential. That potential is to wake up or go deeper into ignorance. But we cannot live without the notion of I because we have the seventh consciousness. It works. That's how we distinguish between tasty and tasteless, pure and impure, clean and dirty. It's very, very essential. Without that, we also cannot live. But if the notion of I as the main product of the seventh consciousness is unclear, we produce suffering. We create a lot of unhappiness for one another and ourselves. The eighth is the storehouse. Long-term and short-term memory. So the level which distinguishes between your subconscious and your conscious self is made by the seventh. Most of your memory which you label as good or bad, me or not me, resides in your subconscious as archetypes. It's a great merit of Western psychology to have discovered it independent of any religious tradition. It just happened that Freud, Jung, Adler, and all these folks, they did their homework. And this is wonderful. Your conscious self is about 5 to 10 percent, mostly 5. And 95 is your subconscious. So your seventh and eighth consciousness together, that's your soul. When you are in the body, you have conceptual thinking, willful thinking, you have a brain. And this is not where it resides, it's where it acts, okay? Your thinking can go from one place to another, but without the brain, you can't have it as a functional, autonomous process. That's why brain dead people, unfortunately, they are incapable of thinking. They still have dreams. The seventh and the eighth, they operate, 
The sixth is damaged because the brain is damaged. When we die, the first six runs out because the body becomes dysfunctional and we cannot return to it. But the seventh and the eighth together, that's the soul, like the driver of the car. And depending on your experience, you're looking for your new car, your new body to continue. Now, that's the way Mahayana Zen looks at it. I do not expect you to believe this. But if it's a matter which might interest you and you want to investigate further, there are many ways to do that. And as a passing note, uh, until like the second, maybe third century AD, there were serious movements within early Christianity like the Gnostics who operated with previous lives. They had a notion. Because when your mind is clear, then the seventh actually has gates. And through those gates, you can look into your past. There are techniques to do that. Zen does not go uh, regressional. So we don't do just returning previous lifetime practice. What is interesting, that Zen always teaches you to stay clear at this moment, right here, right now. And in an effort to do that, all your previous karma that makes a hindrance, they all appear. So if you have anything unfinished from previous lives, it appears right in front of you. Becoming conscious, deal with me, solve me. And then you get back to here and now. You become complete, you become clear. That's what I call the self-cleansing capability of your mind. So when you meditate, that is naturally being activated. And you don't need anything external to that. Just correct teacher, correct teaching, correct peer group or student's group. So that's the kind of brief definition of the soul. And remember, any part of the software can be changed. Your soul has no fixed entity, and that's where anatta has one aspect. But the other aspect is also important, that the Atma Brahman never incarnates. That's also a very important part of the original teaching. Because with Hindus, they had so many attributes to the Atma Brahman that it almost became like the Western concept of God, that it has a beard and white clothes, etc. But anything, anything in the realm of the six senses is irrelevant because true God, true Buddha is beyond name and form. And that's why in Zen they used to say, if you meet the Buddha, kill the Buddha. Because if you meet him or her, that's illusory, for sure. Because it's a phenomenon. It's something you can see, hear, taste, smell, touch, and think. And your true nature has no name, no form, no life, no death, no birth, no decay, none of that. So, body and soul, they are both conditioned, impermanent, imperfect, and interdependent. Your true nature is not. That's what perceives the whole thing. So your true self is none of the eight levels of consciousness, but perceives and operates all the eight. Hence the equation, the clearer you are, the more complete you feel. The more complete you feel, the clearer you are. There's a direct correlation between the two. Okay? What length and frequency of meditation do you recommend? A frequency is every single moment and length is into infinity. <laughs> Within that, I can give you some advice. <laughs> every day on this earth consists normally of 24 hours, and uh, except night shifts. It seems longer then. <laughs> so, so when that happens, uh, in the morning it's good to meditate a little bit, and also in the evening, if you have time, to so start and end the day with some meditation. Meditation can have three basic techniques. Um, one is physical, when you move the body. We do some bows, sometimes you do some exercise. Uh, body and mind come back together to this moment. Next is chanting. Every religion, every single spiritual movement has chanting. Remember that. And that chanting starts to purify your soul, shuts out the noise, brings the spiritual signals to the focus of your attention. And that chanting is very, very important. And then next can come some sitting, some 
introspective, clear meditation. You do that twice a day, you'll see results very soon. And then you can keep that mind, moment to moment, not lose it, keep that mind. And that's why we do retreats. It's to really get into the habit of staying clear, staying focused, and staying relaxed at the same time. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, what exactly is Buddha nature? I don't know. It's but not, I it's, ask you, who is talking to me right now? I mean, is it universal consciousness or is it... I don't know. I don't know either, but I'm asking <laughs> you a question which helps you realize it. Bear with me. Who is talking right now? I am. Where does this I come from? You know, from my mind? Where does your mind come from? From the cells working in my brain? No. Not true. Your cells are the medium. They are not the original function. Otherwise, you couldn't dream. Mm -hmm. Where does your mind come from? Do you know? I don't. That's your Buddha nature. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good shot. You, you kept at it. And just to clarify, that here don't know is not the lack of information. It's the absence of ignorant views. It's the absence of dualistic thinking. I lead you to don't know, and I'm not deceiving you. I'm leading you to a place where there is no thinking. And if you experience it deeply, right here, right now, your mind becomes clear like space, clear like a mirror. That's big don't know. When you cannot find your way, that's small don't know. I read the other day where there, they now have proof that, or evidence that the mind continues after death for a certain period of time, maybe a couple of minutes. But there was at least one case where a guy was dead for two hours and his mind was still functioning. So that led me to wonder if the mind is independent of the brain. The mind uses the brain when we are born and while we are alive, and it unravels and loses that functionality when we die. And what you refer to is the conscious thought, the intellect. But like I pointed out with the previous question, we have a lot more mental functions than just conscious thought. So that does not stop. The intellect kind of runs out of steam as we lose chi and we are separating from the body. Remember, all the metabolism of the body supports brain activity. And without that, we couldn't think, we couldn't feel, we couldn't run the system. That's when you have a lot to see, a lot to feel, a lot to think, you get exhausted. You use your chi reserves. You use your energy. Well, in the state of clinical death, people can see many things. And the difference between clinical death and real death is that you can return to the body because it gets fixed. And with real death, you cannot. And what happens after this well, it's subject to a lot of religious interpretations. The best is your own experience, and I do not mean try to die. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. Not even clinical death, you know, just the right amount of morphine. No, no. Same sentence, no. It's perceiving the mind which is beyond life and death while you are in the body. You know, that's what I want to emphasize. The marvelous aspect of anything transcendental is that you do not have to die to attain something beyond life and death. Very important. You have to make some effort. Sometimes you cut down on food a little bit. Sometimes you reduce your sensory intake. That's okay. It's practice, sometimes ascetic practice. But you do not have to endanger yourself to go beyond life and death. You just have to make effort, maybe a lot of effort, sustained effort. But you do not have to die to attain freedom from life and death. Okay. Next question. You touched on uh, reincarnation and you referenced the uh, chi in relation to death. Is there a practice or a process for preparing to die or to, if, if one believes in reincarnation, to um, in some Mahayana tradition like Tibetan, there is a lot of practice with that. In Korea, when the time came, they did some, 
but uh, Zen is not really the gradual path in terms of methodology, the sudden path. So moment to moment, go beyond life and death. Moment to moment, do not believe that this lasts forever. So when you are prepared in the mind, then the physical process, when the body is kind of unwell or it's close to letting the mind go, they didn't really have any specific exercise for that. They were ready all the time if they had sufficient attainment. And if not, just practice. Keep it up. But what is common with all practitioners, whether lay or monastic, is that they saw at least a few days, maybe a week, sometimes three, four weeks in advance, that they will depart. And they were not afraid. They took it just as simple and clear as any other matter of life, and they passed on. When you look at the myths, rainbow body, great star in the sky, etc., you can safely discard that. It doesn't help you. But what really helps you is confront your own fears while you are young or middle age. And then when you are old, then you are not afraid. If you are afraid, you have some homework to do. If you have no hindrance in the mind, you have no fear. Read the Heart Sutra. The Mahaprajna Paramita Sutra has very little psychology in it, but what it has is supremely important. It says, no hindrance, therefore no fear. Rephrase, or turn it around, if you have fear, you have hindrance. Some illusion, still chunky, it's there. You still believe in some wrong views. You still have some dualistic idea. That's when the fear of death comes. And the preparation is everlasting. It means every single moment, be clear. And life and death are no problem. Because actually, the biggest fear is not death. Most people are afraid of life. Living is a big adventure. Sometimes it's huge, and sometimes it's shocking. And uh, you can see youth that are really afraid of life. So. Take fear away, then life and death are no problem. Do you think that our true nature or our mind can heal our physical body? Within limits. It's not infinite possibility because, but because our bodies are finite. We are subject to cause and effect. The body is born and it dies. Subject to decay and happiness, all kinds of stuff. But our soul, the way our karma plays out, our thinking, our emotions, we have a deep impact on the body. So you fix the mind, then it activates the self-healing capability of the body itself to the extent of your belief system. We are our own limitations. And if you remove those limitations, you can really do something, not just for yourself, but for all beings. Sung San Sanim uh, practiced really hard, so he contracted some illnesses because he used his body to the utmost. And he wasn't concerned about just healing himself. And that's why I'm not suggesting that you, just, you should just concern yourself with that. What you should concern yourself with is not to make yourself sick. It's a very different thing. Sometimes you need a doctor. That's all right. But have some cleansing, some purification in the mind that prevents you from making yourself sick. So, Sung San Sanim had a heart condition in the 80s, and uh, at that time he resided in New England, in Providence, Rhode Island. He was taken to hospital. And the doctors, they had known he was a Zen master. So they asked him, Zen master, Zen master, we know you can meditate. Can you fix your heart? And then Sung San Sanim says, Yeah, if I went up to the mountains for a hundred days, I could fix my heart. <laughs> then they asked him back, Then why didn't you do it? And he said, Because it would not be correct teaching. I've been trained in originally the Mahayana Tibetan traditions and more recently Theravada traditions. So my current practice is Anapanasati. So how does that relate to Zen meditation form? Again, I'm very ignorant about Zen. Theravada and Mahayana are methodologically different, but they are two doors to the same room. You do them right, 
you attain what we call emptiness. So I am curious if animals uh, have the chance to become not Zen thinkers, but is there an afterlife for them? Are they uh, passing through this life? Have they been perhaps have the soul of someone else inside of them? Wow, I think that's the question I'm going to ask tonight from my host's cat. We have a cat in the house. <laughs> if you get and an answer, ask would you... her. <laughs> is this you in the cat body <laughs> or some other animal? Maybe the snake next door. It could be. Is that yes. you? Then she would just say, Well, sometimes. Oh! <laughs> Perfect answer. Okay. I'll right. ask uh, her again. Say, Do you believe in your next lifetime? Where? Just give me some food, you know. So cats and dogs and other animals, they don't have such problems as we do. So your question is cute, but actually <laughs> projecting our own thinking into animal realm is not yielding any truthful result, okay? Mm -hmm. It makes good movie, okay? Okay. <laughs> uh, have you guys seen this great movie called A Dog's Purpose? No. Now, think about that. Somebody really got it spot on. Because for me, it rings a bell. I totally believe that the basic idea of that movie is true, but we can never prove it. It's enough if you see your own past, your own present, and your own future to the extent that you can. Mm -hmm. But if you haven't watched it, rent it, download it legally, whatever. But a dog's purpose is a homework. Please entertain your family and yourself with a nice bag of popcorn and watch it. It's great. It's, it's really great. As a person who comes late to Zen, it seems to me that, that the discussion perhaps of the degree of effort and time involved and study is in excess of the years I have left. And how many years do you have I, left? I really don't know. There may so be, then how can you compare? That's true. That's true. I, so, uh, I, I don't know. I don't very know. good. So point of concern erased. Just do it right now. You don't know how many years you've got left. I don't know either. So every morning we meditate with Will. We don't know whether there's a next morning. Just kidding. But do not worry about time. Do not worry about age. Do not worry about incarnation. Improve your quality now. Just now. You do that, you do the greatest favor for yourself and for the rest of humanity. Just do that. And your question is very valid. But don't worry about time. Improve your qualities. Improve your clarity. That's our job. Okay? You're welcome. Right here in front. Okay, this might be totally irrelevant, but do inanimate objects have consciousness? As this stick. <laughs> I mean, is consciousness part Let of Let me do this for you. It says, stop asking me stupid questions. <laughs> this is not about you. I did the job, OK? You owe me. Because... More questions? The question remains what you call inanimate. You go into a forest, it's alive. You go into the sea, it's, even if it's just water, because there's no sharks around or other fish, it feels different. So what is inanimate and animate? Drop the concept and then feel the environment where you are. Reflect it clearly. Trees do not talk. We have ideas. But if you say trees are alive, it's not the same life as we have. But they are not dead, far from it, unless we cut them with a chainsaw. So perceive information and energy together, and that's life. So information and energy tied to some form. That's when we have a body, that's when trees have their own consciousness, that's when even rocks and uh, Mother Earth, we call it Mother Earth, of course. The Earth hasn't sent a message back whether she's happy with this or not. So we have our projections, but if you take them away, you can really perceive that. 
can really become one with that. That's when trees actually teach us. The sea teaches us. The mountains, the rivers, the lakes, the sky, the clouds become our teachers when we take away these projections. What do you recommend for Zen practitioners to bring compassion into their practice? Become one with the environment. Primarily with the human beings that are around you is the most difficult part. This becoming one with the mind of the other person, that's the root of compassion. Because you feel what I feel. Sometimes you can even perceive what I think if you have a real sharp mind and good sensor. This oneness is the root of compassion because it's inescapable. You cannot not feel what the other person feels. You cannot not go through at this moment what the other is going through. And then spontaneously when somebody is thirsty, you give that person drink. And when the person is hungry, you give that person food. But many times we are so mistaken and somebody is hungry and we give them drink and vice versa. You don't see what's going on in the other person's mind and heart. And I hasten to add, there's a lot of emotional aspect to compassion, but it's not an emotional posture. Otherwise, we would get exhausted right away. We would become like a super suffering grandmother who is always worried about their grandchildren, okay? But compassion is way deeper than that. So if you just have benevolent emotions, it's fine. If you have good intention, it's fine. But do you have the clarity to really perceive the other person's mind? So become one with those people. Once you do that, you are really considered compassionate, although outside you may not display that much emotion at that moment. You may be even tough. You may be even reticent and not say much. But then they will trust you because they feel you understand them. Most people interpret this as, oh, he or she understands me. There was not much of an information exchange, but there is a heart-to-heart -heart connection. And that heart-to-heart -heart connection is the root of compassion. The first sign that this happens between human beings is trust. Genuine trust. Not just an interest-based relationship, but actual connection. Real trust between one another. So the root of that is compassion and mutual compassion. Just talking about it does not really cut it. What actually has to happen that we have the courage to be silent with each other. We talk our lives away. 70-80% of all human communication is just validation of who we are and what the other thinks about us and vice versa. So you cut that crap and you sit down and you are silent together. And you bear the moment and bear each other's presence. Remember this quotation, be still and know that I am God. Stillness is the real message. What this I is and what God is, that's subject to investigation. Discover that. Attain that. And then we become spiritually adults. We become empowered into higher truth than just conceptual. And one of the spontaneous functions of our enlightened self is compassion. It's inescapable. And the other very important companion is wisdom. Non-dualistic wisdom and unconditional compassion. They go hand in hand like the two wings of an aircraft. And if you don't have wisdom, compassion can totally derail into just selfish emotional life very quickly. And if you have just wisdom but no compassion, it can go into dry and selfish cognition, just being smart or abstract. So if the two are balanced, then our mind and our heart, they function harmoniously and we can create a better world for each other. Because make no mistake, no matter what you think about a higher entity or higher entities or the lack thereof, we are creating this world for each other with our thoughts, 
with our speech, with our emotions, and with our actions. If you just look at that, we have a huge responsibility. That responsibility can be exercised if we are clear. If our mind has no distortions, no delusions, no ignorance, and no false identifications. That's our great responsibility as humans. If we attain that, we attain freedom. And this freedom is very different from the Western ideas about freedom. Here's where freedom and responsibility combine. And not just doing what I want or getting what I desire, which is the most prevalent definition here. So I hope all of us practice and follow the true path to awakening, that we attain compassion and wisdom together, and save all beings from suffering, thereby making this world a better place to live for us and for many generations to come. Thank you for your attention.